السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو دی سیریز آف لیکچرز آن ایڈوانسڈ کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر ان آر لاسٹ لیکچر وی ڈسکسڈ ہاؤ ٹو ڈیفائن دی کنٹرول سگنلز فار آر سیمپل پروسیسر ایس آر سی وی سیڈ دیٹ دیز کنٹرول سگنلز وڈ ڈیپینڈ آن دی پروسیسر ان کوشچن اینڈ آلسو دی امپلیمنٹیشن آن ڈیٹا بس سو دی انٹرنل ڈیٹا بس وچ وی ڈسکسڈ از اے یونی بس سو وی پروسیڈ ود دس ایگزامپل اینڈ سیڈ دیٹ ہاؤ ڈو وی ڈیرائیو دی انفارمیشن فرام دی فرام دی انسٹرکشن سیٹ ریجسٹر اینڈ ڈفرینٹ پارٹس وڈ سگنیفائی ڈفرینٹ کنٹرول سگنلز ٹو بی جنریٹیڈ فار ایگزامپل فار the placeholders R A R B and R C we were able to generate through a logic interface circuitry to get the output signals in order to enable the load for a particular register from 0 to 31 or to get an output for a particular register R 0 out R 1 out and so on these control signals should be appropriately generated in the required timing intervals in our case we have eight timing intervals defined from t0 to t7 so in each case all the control signals which are generated in one timing step are simultaneous and from one timing step to the other timing step the set of control signals would change as an example we just discussed that in the case of fetch all the fetch instructions would require three timing steps for our example src processor with unibus implementation today we will continue and see the remaining two group groups of instructions that is the branch and the shift instructions last time we discussed the arithmetic instructions and the load and store instructions we will see today that how using the logic circuitry logic interface circuitry we implement the branch conditional as well as non conditional unconditional branches and the corresponding shift right or shift left instructions using our interface logic circuitry let us go and look in more detail with the help of following slides this slide shows the implementation using the logic circuitry for branch instruction now the lower most least significant three bits in the instruction register would define the condition for the branch that means if it is an unconditional branch or it is a conditional branch or branch on zero branch on plus branch on minus so these three bits are fed as an input to a 3 to 8 decoder the output of the decoder is available as one of the eight options 0 up to 7 in this example we have used only the first six outputs from 0 to 5 6 and 7 are unused 0 corresponds to never branch and 1 corresponds to always branch 2 to jump on 0 3 to jump on not 0 and 4 jump on plus and 5 jump on minus now the implementation is very simple if we have jump on negative we look at the contents of the register which is available on bus so we have 32 bits on the bus we take the sign bit which is bit number 31 and feed it as an input to an and gate 
the second input to this AND gate is the output number 5 of the decoder. So, if the sign bit is 1 indicating a negative contents of the register, the output of this lowermost AND gate would be 1, it would be high which is fed to an OR gate. So, the output of the OR gate would be high indicating the negative condition, the contents of the register would be negative and therefore, the CON 1 bit register would be activated, it would have a an output which is 1. Now, we complement this particular sign bit 31 through an inverter and feed it as an input to the next AND gate which is ended with condition 4. So, therefore, this would indicate a positive number in the register. So, this condition would be greater than or equal to 0 or meaning plus output of this is fed again to the same OR gate and it would set the condition register to 1 if the contents are positive. Now, the next condition to be tested is if the contents are 0. So, all the 32 bits are fed to a NOR gate and if and only if all the 32 bits are 0, the output of this NOR gate would be high and that is ended with a condition 2 of the decoder, output of this particular gate would be 1 and this is fed again as an input to the same OR gate indicating the contents of the register as 0. Now, the output of this NOR gate is again inverted and therefore, if the contents are not 0, we just end it with the condition 3 of the output of decoder and that would indicate a condition not 0. So, 1 corresponds to always branch and without any further processing is fed as an input to the same OR gate. So, all these conditions depending upon the contents of the register we will jump on 0 or branch on 0 or branch on minus or plus and therefore, as a result the 1 bit CON register would have A1 on any one of these 6 conditions which we have defined as the output of the decoder. With this background of implementation, let us now see the structural implementation and the corresponding control signals defined for 2 examples, one for simple branch and one for branch with link. The table in this slide indicates branch on 0. So, the syntax reads as branch 0 R B comma R C. The first three timing steps T 0 to T 2 correspond to instruction fetch as already explained. In timing step T 3, the contents of register R C are tested and based on the condition as defined earlier, the 1 bit register CON would be set. For this case, we need to have the corresponding control signal as L CON in order to be able to write to the CON register. R C E and R 2 bus control signals are required to read the data from the register defined by placeholder R C and that data would be available on the bus. So, these two control signals R C E and R 2 bus would enable the contents of register R C to be placed on the internal bus of the processor. In timing step T4, we take the contents of 
register RB and place it to the PC. So, it would be effectively the branching to the address indicated by the contents of register RB and the corresponding control signals would be R, B, E and R2 to bus in order to enable the data from register RB to come to the bus. LPC would enable the load signal so that the data could be written into the program counter PC and this would happen if and only if con is equal to 1 which means the condition defined by the contents of register R C in this case would determine whether con is 1 or not. The next part of the table indicates the branch and link example. There is only one additional timing step. So, what we had in T4 is now available in T5 and in T4 we have saved the previous contents of the program counter into register R A. So, the syntax is branch link on 0 R A R B and R C. So, therefore, in this case we in T4 step take the contents of P C and save it to register defined by R A. The control signals for this particular step would be R A E and bus to R in order to be able to write the data available on bus into the register R A and P C out would be activated if the condition is satisfied that means the con is equal to 1. So, for the case of branch on 0, we need 2 timing steps for execution whereas, we have 3 timing steps for executing branch and link. Now, we have taken this example with 0. Similarly, the other instructions on plus minus could be interpreted exactly in the same way. Now, we see in this slide the condition which would test the corresponding number of and that would be used for a shift instruction. Now, the at least 5 significant bits out of these 32 bits available in IR would give us the count for which we need to shift and we have defined this also as a register renamed it as small n with 5 bits. So, the 5 bits of this count are fed to a NOR gate. So, therefore, the output of this NOR gate would be 1 if and only if the count is 0 that means all the 5 bits are 0 and this is defined as a control signal capital N equal to 0. Capital N represents the decimal count of the 5 bits from 0 to 4. Let us now see how do we use this particular count in the form of generating the control signals for the shift instruction. The next table shows the control signals for the shift write instruction. As usual, the first three steps correspond to instruction fetch. In T3, we just transfer the five least significant bits from instruction register into a register named small n and for that we need to activate load n signal. In step T5, we test the condition for n equal to 0. If n equal to 0 is true, then we take the 
contents of register R C and transfer the contents to the register given by small n. This would be done if and only if n is equal to 0, which means that now the count would be given in register RC that would be defined by register RC. If n is not 0, then n itself would define the number of shifts desired. In this case, we need to activate the control signals LN in order to load the data into register N and to place the contents of register RC to the bus, we need to activate RCE and R2 to bus. In T5, we transfer the contents of register RB with capital N shifts and concatenate the leftmost N bits with 0. So, replicate the capital N bits on left side with 0. For this particular timing step, we need the control signal LC in order to write into register C and shift right N is a control signal given to ALSU. This is implemented by applying the 5 bits of N register to the select inputs of the barrel shifter and activating the control signal SHR as explained in one of the earlier lectures. The barrel shifter is a faster implementation for implementing the shift right instruction. In timing step T6, we now transfer from buffer register C the data which is a shifted version of the original contents and place it to the destination register RA. The corresponding control signals C out and RAE and bus to R. So, therefore, we need to be able to write into register R A. The output of C is placed into register R A. I hope by now you have a fairly good idea that how to define the control signals and then how to implement these by using a logic circuitry. Although we could have done without the logic circuitry, but this gives a better insight into the definition and generation of the control signals. Now, once we have the structural description of different instructions in the instruction set of a processor, we took an example of SRC. Similar instruction set is available for Falcon we discussed only a couple of examples for Falcon. The remaining examples for Falcon are exactly similar to the SRC except for as we said that there would be two additional control signals for in and out. In the case of Falcon, the input output is non-memory mapped whereas in the case of SRC, it is memory mapped. So, in end, we, we could say simply that defining the structural RTL table for different instructions would give us all the necessary control signals required in different timing steps. So, with the help of examples, we have illustrated what are different control signals in examples of arithmetic instructions, for the case of logic instructions, for the case of shift instruction and for the case of branch instructions. And in all these cases, we have defined the different control signals. Once we know these control signals, now we will turn our attention for the rest of the lecture today and see that how the control unit would synchronize the external and internal activities together by using the data signal and these control signals which have been generated 
based on the information in the instruction register. Now we turn our attention to another important aspect and that is the control unit. Control unit is an important part of the CPU and this is not a very easy job to design a control unit. The control unit is responsible for generating the timing signals and the corresponding control signals. It also synchronizes the activities within the CPU and external to the CPU and then it would also tell us or tell the data path which particular control signal is required and what to do in different timing steps. There are primarily two approaches for designing a control unit. We could design the control unit with a hard wired approach or we could use a micro programming for implementing the control unit. In the case of hardwired approach, it is simpler, it is relatively faster, however the design is more complex. For the case of micro level, micro controlled implementation, it is usually slow because the ROM in which the instructions would reside would be accessed and it would be relatively slow as compared to the hardwired implementation. However, it is much more flexible as compared to the control unit designed on the basis of hard wiring. However, for the sake of explanation, we will first look into the hardwired implementation of the control unit. The microcontrolled or the micro instructions we will discuss later on after we have discussed the pipelining concept in the next chapter. Now the control unit could basically be considered as a finite state machine. Now each timing step could be considered as just one state and therefore from one timing step to another timing step the state would change. Now if out of the complete control unit conceptually we separate the timing generator then the remaining part primarily would be reflected in the form of a combinational circuit and we will just consider it in more detail in a short time. Now when you consider it as a black box, the control unit when we consider it as a combinational circuit to be implemented as a black box, what are different inputs and what are the corresponding outputs? There would be four inputs to the control unit. The first input as we said is the output of the timing generator. So therefore each step, each timing step, you remember for our example processor we have eight timing steps T0 to T7. Now remember that one clock cycle of our clock would correspond to one timing step and we have in our example eight disjoint timing steps as represented by T0 to T7. So this would form first input to the control unit. The second input is the opcode and this is first passed through a decoder and the output of the decoder is given to the control unit. We will see that concept in more detail in one of the later slides. The third input is the input generated by the data path like the CON signal 
is generated depending upon a particular condition. That could be the input to the control unit. The finally fourth input could be the input generated by some external event. And this could be in the form of, for example, an interrupt generated by an interrupt generator. Now, based on these four inputs, we get the output control signal, which in different states would activate the different activities and coordinate and synchronize the activities in the data path. Now, the complexity of the control unit would actually depend on the basic three parameters, that is the number of inputs which we have and the number of the timing steps which we have and the corresponding the number of output control signals which need to be generated. Let us now look into the hardwired implementation of the control unit in a little bit more detail with the help of some slides. As already explained, the block diagram in this slide shows a hardwired implementation for a control unit. The inputs are the timing step generator, signals from the data path, decoded opcode from the instruction register and signals from external devices. The output signals to various parts of the processor would be generated by the control unit. Next slide shows how to generate the control signal based on the opcode. Now, this is an example for the Falcon A processor where the instruction is 16 bit long. The most significant 5 bits in this case from bit 11 to 15 shows the opcode. Bit 11 to 15 these 5 bits are fed as an input to 5 to 32 decoder. These 5 bits would determine one of the 32 outputs. These 32 outputs are numbered from 0 to 31 and named as OP01 up to OP31. These are the names assigned to the control signals and followed by these names, we have also indicated the mnemonics for this particular processor which is Falcon A. In your notes, you have a similar diagram for the SRC processor as well. The mnemonics would be different in that case. The input instruction length would be 32 in that case, but still the most significant 5 bits would be used. In both these processors, the 5 bits are used to represent an opcode and therefore we have one of the 32 options for the output of the 5 to 32 decoder. For the design of hardwired control unit, the next step is to design and be able to write the control equations. Control equations primarily are Boolean expressions or Boolean equations. Now we need to go into the structural RTL description of each instruction. We need to browse through this description and see which particular control signals occur in different timing steps. Now for each instruction we will have one such table defining what is being done and what corresponding control signals need to be activated in each state. Now for example, for our SRC or for Falcon, we will have 32 maximum such RTL descriptions and for each instruction, we, will, we, we would have the corresponding 
control signals for each step. At the most, we will have eight corresponding timing steps in our example. So after browsing, we need to see that each control signal under what conditions would be activated. And finally, we need to write the expression in the form of a logical expression as a combination of AND and OR of different control signals. So each control signal would be represented in the form of a combination, a logical combination of different control signals. Now this might look a difficult job, but let us say up to 32, 32 different instructions, maybe it is manageable. If we have an opcode, for example, with 8 bits, then we would have 256, which is 2 raised to power 8 such tables. And it may not be managed by hand, but it's very simple to automate and you can just browse and collect different conditions which would generate and activate a particular control signal. Now we can see that with the help of uh, some examples and let us look at the table given in the next slide. Now this table shows Boolean equations for some example control signals. Now some examples for control signals are PC out, load, MAR, increment 2 and so on. Let us look at some example. PC out for example would be active in every T naught timing step, the first timing step. So that means the first instruction in a fetch cycle would be to activate PC out so that the contents of the program counter could be placed on the internal bus. Then in timing interval T3, the output of the PC would be activated if either the op code is 20 or op code is 22. These op codes 20 and 22 represent a jump or a subroutine call in timing step T3. This would mean that whenever there is a jump or a call instruction, the contents of PC need to be saved. Similarly, in timing step T4, if the op code is 16, 17, 18 or 19, again we need to have a PC out to be activated. And these four instructions correspond to conditional jumps. So looking at this Boolean equation, Boolean expression you could say in step T naught always we need to have PC out to be activated. And in T3, if the instruction is either a jump or call. And in T4, if it is one of the conditional jumps. Now in the form of logic circuit, the implementation is shown in the next slide. Now you can immediately see that we are OP20 and 22 and end it with T3, then or all 16, OP16 up to 19 and end it with T4 and then T0 and ended output of T3 and T4 is all together to obtain a PC out. So we write PC out equal to T0 plus T3 ended with within bracket OP20 plus OP22 and odd with T4 ended with OP16 to 19. Now exactly in the same way we could formulate the Boolean equations for other control outputs. Let us look at the LPC control signal. 
this is activated in T1 time interval where we load the PC with the incremented PC contents like INC2 in the case of Falcon which we are discussing. Similarly, for T5 ended with OP20 which is again a jump instruction and T6 with a condition ended with OP16 to 19. The implementation is shown in the next slide and it is very simple to see that the load PC control signal would be generated under one of the following conditions. Looking at this table, we could see that the simplest of the control signals could be increment 2 that is always activated in T naught and no other condition. Similarly, load instruction register that is in timing step T2 after fetching the instruction we load it to the instruction register. The remaining Boolean equations could be similarly analyzed and these are the examples for the Falcon processor. Exactly in the same way you could formulate and write down the Boolean equations for SRC processor. After establishing the Boolean equations and its corresponding implementation in the form of logic circuits, we have a simple overview and we till now have assumed that the gates are ideal. That means there is no propagation delay. Actually, when we implement the control unit, it is not so. The propagation delays for the gates could not be neglected. In particular, if different gates are cascaded, as we have seen in the examples, the output of one gate forms the input to the next one, the cumulative propagation delay would add up. Another aspect which should be looked into is that in the case of our timing step generator, we have assumed an input clock. Now, we could not arbitrarily increase the frequency of this clock. That means the cycle time for the clock could not be decreased arbitrarily. What are the factors which would determine the clock frequency or the minimum clock time? Now, look, if we have, for example, a, a transfer from one register to another register, the output contents of the register would first be fed to a tri-state buffer which would be activated. So, the first delay would be the gate delay corresponding to this particular buffer. Then, this buffer would drive the bus, the internal bus which primarily is a set of conductors of some finite length, may be small, but then we will have a delay in the form of bus. Now, on the other end, we will have, for example, the ALSU or any combinational circuit. So, we will have followed by the delay, propagation delay of bus, we will have the combinational circuit delay or delay because of the gates. And then we will feed this data into some latches or the other register. And these latches would also give some delay. Now, all this delay would mean that when the data is fed or put into, written into the second register and we give a command of a control signal that write into register, destination register from the source register. So, it could not be done, for example, if one particular clock cycle is too narrow or on what factors would it depend? We have just said that these propagation delays all calculated together, added together as an example, 
let us say we have around 25 nanosecond as the minimum time which is required because of propagation. If we for example take some overhead and make it 30 nanosecond then the maximum the 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 maximum clock frequency that we would have is 1 over 30 or 10 raised power 30 over 30 it is 33 approximately 33 megahertz that would be defining the clock frequency now this thing could be explained with the help of an example which is given in the next figure with a table with some typical figures for two particular cases and that gives a fairly good idea of what would be the maximum clock frequency which could be supported for a particular control unit. This slide shows the idea as explained earlier from a source register up to a destination register in between we have the bus and the logic block in the form of combinational logic. T G corresponds to gate propagation time and T comp corresponds to the delay in ALSU. There are other two parameters the setup time and the hold time for the flip flop and these would be given by the manufacturer of the devices. There are two typical examples for two different devices one a fast TTL and the other one a gallium arsenide gates and the corresponding flip flops. Based on the data given in this table one could easily calculate and see that for fast TTL the minimum time which could be adjusted is 30 nanosecond and if we allow 10 percent safety margin that gives us 33 nanoseconds and it corresponds to a maximum clock frequency of 30 megahertz whereas in the case of the gated array the clock frequency can be calculated and based on the timings altogether this turns out to be 625 megahertz. Till now the data path implementation has been assumed to be unibus. That means there is only one bus which interconnects different resources, different registers together. So at one time either we read out and put the data from one register or into another register. Now this is not the only possible implementation. We could provide more than one bus in CPU and that gives us an implementation for example a two bus implementation. In the case of two bus implementation we say that we have an in bus and an out bus and the output of the register for example could, could be given to one of these buses and input could be read into from the other bus. Now the advantage of having two buses together would be to provide more connectivity, more paths and then simultaneously instead of having one activity of data transfer we could have more than one activity for data transfer. And let us look into a little bit more detail on this two bus implementation and see what is the advantage that we gain out of the two bus implementation. This is indicated in next slide. The slide shows a two bus implementation for the SRC, the simple risk computer which we have been considering so far. Now each of the two buses is a 32 bit bus. One we call A bus or in bus and the other one B or out bus. 
Now notice a couple of things in this slide. First of all, the output buffer register C at the output of ALSU has been eliminated. We do not need this buffer register anymore because the output of ALSU could be fed to the A bus and this data could be saved in one of the general purpose registers instead of putting it into a buffer register C. Now as a result of having two buses the corresponding structural RTL description would change and as an example in the next slide we have structural RTL description for subtract instruction using the two bus data path implementation. Now in this table the first three steps T0 to T2 correspond to instruction fetch. In T0 we transfer the contents of program counter into MAR. In T1 we take the data from indicated by the address register MAR from that memory location we bring the data and store it into the buffer register MBR and at the same time we update PC by 4. Now this is possible because now we directly have PC at the input of one bus and we add 4 to it and output of the ALSU is written into the program counter. So program counter is updated and T2 as in the previous implementation we take MBR data into the instruction register that completes the fetch cycle. Now in the execute cycle we have now T3 and T4. In T3 we take the contents of register RB into buffer register A and in T4 we have just a subtract A minus R C and place it to register RA which is the destination register. When we compare this implementation with a unibus implementation, one timing step is reduced as compared to a unibus. So that might mean a saving and improvement in throughput or performance. How much better performance quantitatively we will get that would depend on other factors too we will see later. But just if we simplify then for this particular subtract instruction instead of six timing steps we have now five timing steps and therefore we have saved one timing step in this case and that might mean an improvement by a factor of around 1 by 6 which is about 16 percent but in practice taking into account the propagation delays and other factors we might have an improvement of just about 5 to 10 percent. The next slide shows along with the RTL description the corresponding control signals to be activated in each timing step. Now in T0 we need to activate PC out and load the memory address register and along with that we need to have the C equal to B which is a control signal for ALSU meaning that the data would be read from one bus and fed at the output to the other bus. So C equal to B would mean that from the bus data is transferred to the output of the ALSU. The timing step T1 corresponds to having the control signals PC out increment 4 which is for SRC and load program counter, memory read 
memory address out and load memory buffer register. So, for these two concurrent operations that means reading from memory into the buffer register and updating the program counter by 4 would need these control signals. And finally, in T2 the contents of memory buffer registers are placed into IR by activating the control signals MBR out C equal to B and load IR. And further on we will have the execution instructions for the bus to bus implementation. The designer expects that by having a two bus implementation of the data path the throughput would increase. Now, in this example for the case of instruction fetch we still have three timing steps. However, for other instructions we will have reduced number of steps for execution. We have illustrated that with the help of subtract instruction. Similarly, we will have add and other arithmetic instructions where the number of steps for execution would reduce. Similarly, we would have a lesser number of execution timing steps for load and store. That means with memory interaction. However, we still have assumed that the interaction with the memory is such that we get the data within a given time slot. That means memory is assumed to be fast enough. So, if it is not so and this assumption is violated, we need to introduce and fill in the wait states and we need to wait or buffer needs to wait to get the data from the memory and that would also mean an overhead. So, therefore, if we have a two bus implementation, it is not a simple mathematics to say that the number of states have reduced and therefore, the throughput have throughput has increased by the same factor. It would be lesser than that. We will consider next time a three bus implementation and then actually we will try to calculate with the help of an example the improvement in throughput for a two bus and a three bus implementation. But one thing is quite clear that when we go for higher bus implementation the interconnection between different registers would be more and we need to have more hardware in that case. For example, in the case of two bus implementation we also need to have two load signals simultaneously generated and that means based on the register data in the instruction register we would require two decoders instead of one decoder and more hardware might mean more propagation delay and more cost. So, the designer or an architect has to strike a balance between the cost and the benefit that is obtained or in terms of throughput that is obtained from the for from increase of the number of buses to be implemented. So, the data implementation or data path implementation from unibus to two bus and three bus would definitely give an advantage in terms of throughput, but the cost would increase in terms of the number of gates which are used for implementation. Now, for today that is all and we will continue next time with the three bus implementation for our SRC processor and from there on we will go on to some other exceptions and interrupts for the processor. Till next time, Allah Hafiz.